Greetings, everybody, and welcome to the next installment of the video lecture series in Marketing Strategy, Chapter 11. Marketing Strategies for a Digitally Networked World. First of all, does every company need a digital or social media strategy? Well, whenever you use the word every or all, it's generally not, it's generally good to be suspicious of making those declarative uh, statements. So I don't know that every company does, but I would say that most every company does. And I might err on the side of saying that every company does, but uh, I guess there's some that don't. But anyway, we're going to talk about uh, talk about a few of these topics in relationship to marketing strategy. So the first slide, elements characterizing new economy technology. So if you look at this list collectively, they all lie at the heart of viral marketing. And that means that those who see something they like on the web or on an app on their phone, uh, they will generally share it with others. If they do, then it becomes a viral sensation. Right, so we have the ability to optimize, we'll talk about in a second, syndication of information, uh, which I'm sure some of you subscribe to those, maybe you don't know that that's what it's called, increasing returns to scale network products, one of my favorite terms in marketing, mass customization, because it seems uh, very ironic that you could be, that you could mass customize things. Uh, disintermediation, which I hope we all know what that is by now. Of course, global reach. We could reach the globe with a laptop in uh, Cahutta, Georgia, if we wanted to. Uh, it's hot and open 24 seven. And uh, if it's an informational good, you can get instantaneous delivery, which makes it uh, different than if it was a, uh, if the product was, you know, more tangible in nature. And that way you can only sell it once. Information you can sell a bunch of times. But anyway, we'll take those up. So what does ability to optimize mean? Well, if we think about one side of the equation being a billboard and the other side being a, an Instagram ad, digital tools make a lot of things measurable that you couldn't, the same amount of measurability would not apply to a billboard. We can measure how many cars pass a billboard, but we can't see how many eyes within those cards within those cars, how many saw our billboard, how many processed the information on it, how many were able to get the phone number or web address. I was thinking, but we can, we can uh, see uh, on a digital ad who clicked on it, who clicked on it, and who clicked through the ad, and who uh, did, were able to convert into a purchase. And things like that. So digital tools make a lot of things measurable that, that weren't measurable in the past. You can also change content uh, on the fly, right? A digital billboard, we could change the price of something or information on something um, quickly. And it helps you optimize your spending because we all know we learned in economics, there's a scarcity of two things in this world, time and money. So if we, uh, if we spend the least amount of money to get the biggest bang for that money and digital tools help us do that, then that's a positive for marketing and for business, right? We could spend that money elsewhere, R&D or maybe employee bonuses. So following that, we have syndication. Loosely, syndication is the sale of the same good it's typically an informational good or intangible good to a bunch of customers 
and they might combine it with information from other sources and distribute it. Think about uh, E-Trade, right? They bring together a lot of information that's content, I mean, that's uh, applicable of interest to their clientele, and they bundle that together and sell it to them. Uh, they might not have generated any of the research or information, but they just uh, were able to crawl, crawl websites and services and provide that information. Huffington Post started that way. They hardly had any authors. They just gleaned information, gleaned interesting things from uh, other authors, and then bundled together and uh, delivered, you know, their particular consumer what they wanted. <clears throat> you can automate it, digitize it, which means you, know, you don't have to have one person for one good. And uh, I'm sure I don't know. I say I'm sure, but. I subscribe to using RSS. You can subscribe to different websites and news sites, and whenever something new comes up, it's kind of like a D2L uh, setting. If when something new is published uh, to a certain website or blog site that I follow, then I'll get a message and go, "There's there's new uh, information there that you're interested in," and that's called really simple syndication. A lot of times you'll see the RSS logo and. You click on that and you can subscribe. So that's syndication. Increasing returns to scale of network products. So one of the primary characteristics of informational networks is that the product becomes more valuable as the number of users increases. That also applies to social media platforms. The more people use it, the more valuable it becomes. That's called a positive network effect or a positive network externality. And uh, marketing in the current day, because of all the, uh, the power of digital marketing and digital tools, we'll typically divide media into owned, paid, and earned. Owned being, you know, the uh, Dalton State website. Dalton State owns that. And controls the information that appears on that. Paid media would be uh, Google ads or banner ads that Dalton State is paid for. Uh, and somebody clicks on it and goes through, they, whoever the vendor is, would charge Dalton State however many cents they negotiated for those words. <clears throat> and earned media, consumer generated or third party generated, but it could be a positive positive review of the Dalton State uh, Spring Campus and how pretty it is by Southern Living Magazine that uh, we didn't pay for, uh, but uh, a lot of people saw it. Or it can be, you know, somebody's really high on your product and they, uh, they generate a, a meme or something about how excited they are uh, about the product and that's earned media you didn't pay for it uh, the consumer put that out efficiently has been facilitated by the internet and digital tools to a great extent where it wasn't even possible 20 years ago. Break it down to a couple uh, different categories, collaborative, filtering, rules-based, personalization, and mass customization, but we're going to come to that in a minute. But uh, personalization is driven by the firm or the marketer. All right, Amazon, the recommender system they have on Amazon is an example of that. Uh, customization is user-driven. Uh, when I was in the electrical contracting business, we primarily dealt in lighting. So we had an uh, account with Granger nationwide, and Granger sells lighting and ballast and all sorts of stuff that we used uh, concerned with lighting. But they also sell all kinds of other stuff, you know, hand cleaner and batteries and orange safety, kind of that kind of stuff. Well, we didn't need that in our online catalog. 
So uh, we told them what we wanted in our online catalog when, when we were going to order. That way we didn't have to plow through all that stuff. So uh, that was nice. And that can improve customer loyalty and make it less likely I'm going to switch somebody else. It increases my switching costs because if I swap from a vendor that has customized a uh, the catalog for me, the online catalog, and based on my uses and purchases, has refined it over the a couple of years, then I have to start that process all over with another vendor. I may not be willing to do that. So that can be very valuable from the marketer's perspective. So. Collaborative filtering. Everybody should be familiar with that if they've ever shopped on Amazon or Jet or Target. And that's when you personalize a market offering to each customer. So based on what you are buying at the time, uh, you know, you'll get the recommendation at the bottom. Now, people that bought this book, uh, a lot of times this book as well or this movie. That's called collaborative filtering. Uh, Rules-based personalization is where you might get a message or a promotion or a giveaway uh, on your birthday or on your uh, anniversary or something like that, where you're able to make, you're able to use formal decision rules on some information. Uh, like every day, time I went to an ATM during the month of March, at Wells Fargo, the first thing I got was a big birthday message. Of course, that means they know when my birthday is. Does that bother me? Not particularly. But some people might be might have privacy concerns about their birthday, their anniversary, or their wedding day, or whatever. Might not like a lot of people know. So that is a, a bit of a fault. Uh, I mean, a bit of a problem with rules-based personalization, but not that big a problem. And then again, one of my favorite words in marketing, the mass, mass customization. Back when I was in college and you were ordering t-shirts for a party or something, and you needed 50, or let's say you needed 45, the t-shirt maker you know, would say, well, we only make them in lots of fee. So you'd have to buy 50 and then tell them how many small, mediums, larges, and extra larges you want. And then... That meant a lot of people had missized shirts and you had, had stuff left over. Now you don't have to do that. Uh, if, I, if I want a, a Merle Haggard Mama Tried t-shirt in an extra large, I can go to Cafe Press, find one, and order it. And they'll print that one up for me and send it to me. Right? So that's user-driven or consumer-driven. And that's an example of uh, mass customization. So it helps the efficiency of the business. And lets you customize to have all sorts of things. You don't just have you don't have to have a limited catalog. You can print anything that's printable on a shirt one at a time or ten at a time. It doesn't matter. Everybody gets just what they want. So, for example, I have the Amazon Assistant on my Amazon account, and uh, unfortunately, my daughter uh, uses. Top picks from their system of a bunch of uh, Chinese uh, shirts and clothing and skirts. You can see they're suggesting for me the uh, Yun J round neck triple color block stripe T-shirt, which I'd probably look good in, but uh, probably not. I'd have to wear it only during quarantine. Uh, so the recommender system on Amazon is jacked up because uh, other people are are using it. But as an example, uh, by the way, I would also like to point out that if you sign up with the Smile program, every time you make a purchase on Amazon, every time I make a purchase, uh, they uh, send part of whatever I spent to the Humane Society of Northwest Georgia. Uh, it's very easy to sign up with, and you just you know, link it to your account. Whenever you buy something, they, they get a nickel. But everybody does. They get money. But back to the example. So which is this? 
mass customization, rules-based personalization, or collaborative filtering. This is collaborative filtering, and it's based on purchases that have been made or interest that has been shown. Unfortunately, it's not my interest. It's my daughter's interest that has that has bled into my account. But still, it's a good example of collaborative filtering using Amazon as the example. So what are some threats? This intermediation, that is cutting out the middleman. The supply chain, the channel that people use to get goods to market, no longer does it have to go from the manufacturer uh, to the wholesaler to the retailer. You can buy, you can cut out the middleman and buy directly from the manufacturer. That's a threat if you're a middleman. Of course, you lose their expertise, but it's a threat. Very few barriers to entry. We could set up a business on the internet and be worldwide if we were selling some sort of information that people wanted or even good, even uh, tangible products and get right into business uh, without ever building a brick and mortar location. And then the cost for syndicated goods approaches zero, the more people use it. So uh, there's really no big wall that keeps you from getting into your business. So if you are really good at your business and you're making money, people will notice. And there's very little that stops them from getting into it unless you have something that is uh, proprietary and hard to replicate. Uh, like uh, Bloomberg sells information, but they uh, they generally sell it through their Bloomberg terminals. So if you subscribe to Bloomberg, you, you have to buy the terminals, which are you know, a couple thousand dollars a piece and a subscription to keep them updated. But if you're managing large amounts of money and you want to know exactly what's going on minute by minute in the investment world, it's obviously worth it for thousands and millions of people because they're very successful. So if you think back to the to your principles of marketing class and your uh, consumer decision making process, this is kind of an overlay on that. The traditional process is that you have a want or a need and you go on information search and, and you create a consideration set. Uh, and then you make the purchase decision and then you have a post purchase evaluation. Uh, to kind of lay this on top of it, this is kind of a, a digital consumer decision-making process. Not exactly, but just a way to think of it. So uh, customer insight. A lot of customer insight can be gained on you, me, and everybody else just by crawling the web. Uh, this morning, I, I looked for uh, something on uh, Google, I do believe I used Google, and uh, I started getting ads for um, the same product uh, on other apps that I was using on my phone. I mean, it was just just that fast. So they're getting it quick. You can get a lot of insight about customers based on what they use, they buy, and that's readily available. Great vehicle for that. Uh, digital marketing is so uh, when new product developers invent you know or refine their product ideas uh, they flows to customers to inform encourage them to buy via promotion customer acquisition it's like that's a great tool uh, digital marketing that allows people to do that conducting transactions right there's no need to take cash to Mercedes-Benz Dome in Atlanta, Georgia, more because everything's digital, right? So you just take your license and your credit card, debit card, and you're ready to go. Or at an arts and crafts fair, people from all over the country selling things. Most everybody's got a square, and they're able to do business. Uh, if you couldn't conduct a transaction online with a credit card, you probably wouldn't use use that uh, firm very much. Delivering digital products, of course, 
digital marketing is a great uh, way to do that. Digital technology, um, you know that from whether you want to download a book or a uh, or a program like EndNote that I use to create uh, bibliographies, right? You get it immediately. You can download it away. Customer service and support, uh, chatbots, where you can type in your question and you get a routinized computer generated typically response. Um, also, you know, most people don't want to have to call a phone number and get somebody for customer service anymore. They'd like to just send an email and they get a return code where they can ship it. Or you'd like to get in a chat with somebody and uh, just take care of business or text. Uh, so, and the structure of, uh, you know, a digitally networked business world makes that easier, as does product return disposal. You can get a return authorization and a shipping ticket. Uh, you can print out and send it back, right? So, there are a lot of applications uh, that a, uh, a digitally networked environment if you apply it to the classic consumer decision making process, there are a lot of ways to make that better and facilitate making that quicker even uh, in the time that we are in now and have been for a little while. So what's the challenge? Well, there's a talent gap in digital marketing. Uh, you know, a lot of uh, boomers might hire a, a Gen Z person thinking, well, certainly they know all of social media uh, because, you know, my nieces and nephews do and just because they're of that age. But, you know, social media marketing is different than plucking around, you know, on TikTok. You're doing it for a reason. And although the platforms are typically free, Effective social media marketing is not free. It's somebody that knows what they're doing and they're doing it for a reason, right? And it's very difficult to find people to manage and lead the necessary efforts and initiatives in a complex area and a rapidly changing area. So you have to have people that are talented coming in and then those that are still willing to learn and, uh, they atop things, and that's a problem. Rather than anybody can set up three platforms for you know ABC pest control and do things, but what are they doing? What's their objective? Is it sales? Is it advertising? Is it improving awareness? Is it jumping into other people's networks? Is it creating viral content? Uh, you know, lead generation, you know, what is it? And finding people to manage that is not as easy as some people think it is. In fact, it's fairly difficult. So the way a company's always generated revenue uh, can get in the way of moving toward developing a digital marketing strategy. You know, well, we've always taken checks and cash, and I don't want to set up a web app where people can pay. Well, I don't want to be able to swipe a understand it when he's out on the job or or whatever. You can get people who are stuck uh, in a rut, but you have to remember that ideas are great, but you know, if you're an entrepreneur or a business manager, you're not the only person with a great idea. There are lots of people that have great ideas. The trick is, how do you execute those ideas? And execution is the key because if the next guy or girl or lady uh, or woman uh, has maybe their idea is not as great, but their execution is perfect and it didn't cause the consumer any problems. Um, they may, you know, rob your business because you have to remember, again, the entry barriers uh, are low on the Internet uh, for digital business. Ideas are great, but the, the barriers to entry are low, so you have to execute your uh, in a 
internet or digitally heavy business uh, in order to be successful and to think where the customers going in the future not just where they are today uh, you know it's always one thing's for certain in life is change and in business that's always true and in marketing it's always true and has always been true however uh, in the current era that we're in it's very fast and uh, very complex and moves at a fast clip so it's a problem you have to see where people are going see where customers are you know if you're the last one to figure out that customers didn't want to call a 1-800 number to return their package they wanted to handle it online and you're the last one to that then you've already lost your customers and there's no getting them back They've already switched and moved on to someplace else that's satisfying their want or their need. All right, and that is Chapter 11, Walker and Mullins, 8th edition, Marketing Strategy, a Decision-Focused Approach. And I will see you on the Internet.